have a poll in your screen. And then if you would click the continue button uh, to, to be recorded, uh, we just record these over the top and you can end polling if you'd like. Uh, all right, most of your paper pencil or 57% uh, are also precision as applied maps. So uh, appreciate it that, uh, oh, I should, Sarah, I have to clear my own um, polling results as the presenter, is that right? Yes. Okay, and they got to see the results? Yes, they did. Okay, awesome. So there's a sample of a record keeping form. Um, some of you have indicated on that poll that you use onmark, O-N-M-R-K.com, and Sarah put that in the chat. Uh, it also is a pretty nice uh, smart device tool that you can use uh, once you set up your fields on a, on a desktop computer. One of the nice features is it gives that rainfall potential right on the landing screen of the app. Uh, and then you can follow your fields and, and what you applied to, for instance, the back 60 uh, add a new application. Pretty slick system. Uh, and on the back end, uh, or at the end of the year, you can print off in a CSV file or an Excel file, uh, all of your application history for that year. Pretty nice little app, but it's again, just one option. So are there any questions? Uh, you can throw them in chat or Q&A. Um, since this is the webinar version of Zoom, uh, attendees don't have have uh, speaking privileges. So it's uh, if you have questions and we trust you do, we'd ask you to throw them up in, in the chat box or uh, Q&A is actually an even better place because Sarah's gonna keep throwing some things up in the in the screen. Sarah, that OnMark uh, address isn't, isn't hyperlinking. You might have to throw something different in there. I'm not sure. So um, if no questions, that's the record keeping and weather data. Let's go to the updated tri-state fertility recommendations. So um, if you registered early enough, you should have gotten, Sarah, can you see my tri-state fertility guide in my screen? Yes, we can. So you should have gotten a hard copy of the tri-state fertilizer recommendations. Um, we hope that, uh, we hope that you got a copy. So uh, Sarah, throw up poll two and poll three, poll two first. The question is, do you have a copy of the 1995 Tri-State Fertilizer Guide? Yes, I know where it is and use it as good reference. Yes, it's here somewhere. No, but I've always wanted a copy. Or can I see that last question? I didn't know there was a 1995 version. <laughs> All right, you can end polling there if you want, Sarah. Um, a lot of you have it. So uh, kudos to you guys, 50% of the respondents have a copy and use it as a reference. A few more of you have it, but may not know where it's at. So launch that third question, uh, Sarah, as we uh, roll into this copy. Just a simple yes, no question. Did your 2020 Tri-State Fertility Guide arrive prior to this meeting? Really, this is a test to see how well the, the postal system worked, Ed. You know, did we get it there on time or not? But, um, and if you didn't receive it on time, uh, Sarah is gonna put in the chat um, where to get the PDF. No, I have not received it yet, but I'm downloading the PDF as we speak. And we would really like you to do that. We would like you to download it as we speak. So, um, so uh, if at by this time you haven't found the chat box, uh, I'd really ask you to kind of uh, struggle to find that. You usually, should be down at the bottom of your your Zoom uh, interface or Zoom screen. But certainly by the end of the meeting, you have to find chat because there's going to be a link that we put in there for you to complete the Ohio Department of Ag paperwork. So. The bulletin 974 that you received, the Tri-State Fertility Recommendations is really, uh, uh, it came, came to the point where those needed to be updated from 1995. And so uh, the folks at Purdue, Michigan State and Ohio State worked hard over 2014 to 2018 to conduct on-farm and small plot research to uh, either confirm or, or 
uh, make subtle changes to the 1995 version. Crops were corn, soybeans, and wheat, key nutrients, NPK, and sulfur. Many sites, many growers and consultants, and those who participated all had soil sampling, leaf tissue sampling, grain, nu grain nutrient sampling, and of course, yield and a little bit of a management survey that helped guide uh, how the data was processed. So my homework for you is to read this twice, uh, read it cover to cover twice before planting. And uh, I don't want you to laugh out loud at that. Please do that. But why the need for a soil fertility guide? Again, this is a little bit of Eric's uh, opinion and I think Ed will chime in here later. Uh, so that once you know your soil test levels, you can agronomically, economically, and environmentally best prepare for the current year's crop and sub subsequent crops after that. So uh, agronomically meaning we're, we're trying to maximize our yield uh, when it's economically, when it economically makes sense. Um, and that all starts at the soil test level. And those items are here in the tri-state recommendations. I'm gonna emphasize just a little bit the economic part. Uh, to me, when I talk with farmers, that's one of the easiest places to, to hit home. And so I just give an example here on the cost of production. Hold the survey just a little bit, Sarah. Um, no, let's, let's roll it out. Throw out that poll question. I want, I want pure answers here. How much do you spend on average for the fertilizer budget in your corn rotation? Less than 150, more than 150. I don't know. I'm not a farmer. And be, be brutally honest. Give them a little bit of time, Sarah. Let's get a few more answers. Uh, answer if you will. Oh, come on, a couple more of you. If it's taking you this long, you didn't know. Less than 150, more than 150. All right, Sarah, we can unpool in there. Uh, so evenly split between um, a less than 150, more than 150, and didn't, not evenly split with didn't know, but 20% uh, of you uh, maybe didn't, didn't really realize what you're spending. So uh, this is an example that uh, is, is assuming that if I'm in the optimal ranges of the Tri-State Fertility Guide, uh, I would apply, I could apply this budget of fertilizer, uh, not too uncommon in Northwest Ohio is a starter package that may include uh, approximately a third of 1034O, uh, a little less than that, a thiosulfate, and then some 28% variations of this. So what I do as an extension educator is every January, I call the retailers that serve our, our farmer clientele in Fulton County and average their price in January, their January pay price uh, for all these products. And those are listed, the average price is listed uh, in parentheses for all of the products. So if I spend uh, five, or if I buy five gallons of 1034, four gallons of thio, the associated prices are at the right, 1250, 632, 660, and so on. My soil test levels suggest that I need, I'm in the optimum range or uh, potentially a little bit of a buildup. We're still gonna apply crop removal, which the tri-states will say for a two year rotation is 230 pounds of potash at 370 a ton, 42 bucks. Two year minus the starter credit on MAP is approximately 175 pounds per acre at 545 a ton, roughly 48 bucks. And then the balance of my nitrogen budget at side dress uh, as anhydrous and the average in January uh, with our retailers was 522. Uh, that that um, knocks out, shakes out at about $52 in a day anhydrous for a total budget of 160, 168. So ask your question if that, or ask yourself if that budget is in line or out of line. Well, if I do good soil sampling and I use the, the soil tri-state fertility recommendations as a guide and, and I'm above the optimum range, I'm, I'm above that or at sufficient levels. Um, let's say for instance, at, with, with MAP, I could cross that MAP. There we go. 
I could strike out that map and I just lowered my fertilizer budget down to 120 bucks from 168. Um, and, and maybe I put on uh, five gallons or an insurance level of 1034.0, whether it's I'm confident in doing that or not, uh, you know, I'm, I may keep it in there. A farmer may keep it in there. If that farmer gets more and more confident in, the, in uh, believing if his soil test levels are above, in this case, 40 parts per million, we'll get to it, uh, or above the optimum range where he does not need to apply any phosphorus, he might consider taking out all of the, the uh, 1034 in that budget and getting down to closer to $108 for that budget. Now, my last scenario suggests, well, maybe, maybe we're applying it at uh, either uh, the cost of phosphorus or potash um, may be high in a given year as the prices are kind of doing now. The Tri-State Fertility Guide give, provides you the option to either cut out a year in a two-year spread or uh, potentially wait a year uh, in the crop rotation to apply either potash or, or phosphorus. And so in this last scenario, I'm suggesting that maybe the phosphorus and, and potash levels are such that I, I only need to apply a one year level, or maybe it's in a, a field where I, I'm using one year application rates, significantly changes that total budget, that total cost uh, down to $126 uh, from where it was. Now, I know just by knowing some of you personally on this call, uh, on this webinar, some of you have manure in your rotation. And so imagine if you can take out all of your potash and all of your map, what that does uh, to your, your fertilizer budget. If I can take another $48 out of this, I'm down to about $80 uh, between some nitrogen and, and starter package. So just, I hope that's a little bit of an interest approach to uh, emphasizing the economics that are associated with the agronomic research that's that's inside the Tri-State Fertility Guide. What I'd like you to do now is I'd like you to take your book out, and this is yours, obviously. I'd like you to take a pen, a pen, actually, a ballpoint pen writes the best in these um, books because they're kind of shiny, but I'm going to ask you to highlight some things uh, just to call your attention to them. For instance, in the executive summary, um, from a soil sampling perspective, the Tri-State Fertility Guide really emphasizes, really emphasizes, I, some of you may have the, uh, I see Ed there says, uh, may have to, Ed, you may have to remove the poll from your own computer. Uh, you might have to exit out of there. I don't, I'm not seeing it right now on my screen. So, um, Back to the executive summary on page seven. The Tri-State Fertilizer Guide, as it did really in 1995, really encourages folks to sample every crop rotation every three or four years. Um, that is uh, not really a big change, but sampling on grids or zones that are less than 25 acres is, and we'll talk more about that. A re-emphasis on uh, our row crops need to be at six to 6.8 for optimum growth. Uh, that's part of the executive summary. And our nitrogen management was one of the changes. Our corn nitrogen ma management, instead of being driven by yield, uh, is now driven by a maximum return to nitrogen philosophy or a, a, a corn nitrogen rate calculator, which is there on that Iowa State website. And we'll post that in the uh, chat in, in a little while. Wheat uh, recommendations for nitrogen have been updated and are ever so subtly changed, but they're really similar to the original recommendations. So again, driven by yield, and we'll get to those in a little bit. Um, we have the new Tri-State Fertility Guide have, has assessed a particular field or zone or grid three different ways, deficient, optimal, or sufficient. So fields that, uh, or grids that are deficient the rate that you will need to apply is crop removal plus fertilizer to build up the test levels. And Ed will talk about that uh, in, in a while. Um, it is recommended that deficient soils have the, the nutrients applied immediately uh, before the next crop. Crop or, or acres, excuse me, fields, acres, grids that are in the optimal range. Uh, we'll use a crop removal rate 
and that can be applied at any time within the rotation. And finally, the sufficient uh, fields or those that are above the optimal range of soil test levels for PNK uh, are fields that do not need to be fertilized at any rate. And the when is uh, there's no need to apply. So flipping to page eight, um, this is in bold on page eight, but I'd ask you to start or box it. Uh, the, the new uh, extractant, not new, it's not new, but the default or the standardized uh, extractant that will be used for all nutrients except nitrogen will be malic three. Um, and that's cha a change from uh, the 1995, which was based on, for, for phosphorus was based on Bray P1. So a couple other highlights on this page, I'd ask you to box the, the average corn and soybean crop, or, or I'm sorry, box uh, this in this chart the optimal level for field crops in the tri-state region is 20 to 40 parts per million malic three. That's for phosphorus and exclusively a corn and soybean rotation. If you have wheat or alfalfa, that gets bumped up just a little bit. On the right-hand side of that chart, um, you may remember that the 1995 tri-state had CEC graduations, at least three, if not more, uh, graduations and how uh, we applied uh, potassium to our fields by CEC. That has since been simplified formally to this chart, where if you have sandy soils, your, your sweet spot is between 100 and 130. If you have loamy or clay soils, it's 120 to, to 170. Dr. Coleman later in the book will actually shows a spot where he simplifies it even more and, and kind of the, the uh, joined optimal level is 100 to 150 parts per million. And so um, it, it, it is even more simplified than that. So I, I would ask you to write that in your book on page uh, eight. Moving forward, uh, a key highlight is the nutrient removal rates per bushel of grain have decreased, especially with pot potassium. So uh, on the next chart, the notable thing you'll see is the potassium rates that are reduced from the, the previous uh, iteration of, of the Tri-State Fertilizer Guide. So a little bit of uh, writing for you, write down a 200 bushel corn crop and a 50 bushel soybean crop. And assuming you're in the optimum levels, Let's quickly write a phosphorus and potassium recommendation. So if you take 200 bushels times 0.35, you get what number? And further, if you take 0.2 units of K2O per bushel times 200, you get 40. So I'm, I should have animated them each individually, but uh, here they are. For a 200 bushel corn crop, you're going to need 70 pounds of P2O5 and 40 pounds of K2O. For that 50 bushel corn soybean crop uh, times 0.8, you get 40 pounds of P2O5 and approximately 60 pounds of K2O. You total them up. That two-year rotation is requesting 110 pounds of P2O5 and 100 pounds of K2O. We'll be back to that in just a little bit. That's writing recommendation based on grain nutrient removal rates. On page nine, if you look at that same 200 bushel corn crop, I'd ask you to box that just for reference. You'll see that the phosphorus level is 70 pounds. However, the K2O is 60. We'll come back to that. The soybean crop is at a 50 bushel yield or 50 bushel crop removal, 40 pounds matches right up on page eight with what I, I have remaining in the screen, but eight pounds is 20 bushels more. So this morning I asked, well, what was the difference? And then I circled those two numbers. So uh, if you go back to page eight, there is a a, what I'll call a K cushion, a potassium cushion built into the tri-state recommendations, okay? So if you add another 20 pounds to that 
40 and another 20 pounds to that 60, you get 140 pounds of K2O is what the recommendation is really written for. So these recommendations with the cushion equal what's in the chart. So I just wanted to make that point of clarification. Any questions on this page? There are none in the chat or the Q&A. Okay. Flipping the page to page 10 and 11, and I really am asking that you're following along uh, flipping pages. Put a star in the top of page 10. Uh, this is a great reference guide uh, to, the, to the key changes in the left-hand column, key changes, middle column, why the change. And then uh, if you're on the PDF version, it would hyperlink to the correct page. But uh, those of you with a hard copy, uh, you can flip to the corresponding page. As we move into soil sampling, uh, I would ask you to highlight that second bullet point that says uh, soil sample every three to four years or no more than 25 acre samples. Sarah, throw that poll question five up if you would. I should have had this up before uh, I talked on the last page. How often do you or your average customers soil sample? We do have some CCAs on. Um, and so uh, ask you, you can choose more than one of these exam, more than one of these options. Every acre, every year, every two years, every three years, four years, whenever I feel like the levels are getting low. Every crop rotation, always ahead of the corn, always after the wheat. Those are kind of the same thing. Not always, but depends if you have wheat in your rotation, I suppose. All right, pretty good participation. We'll end that polling and share those results. Um, every three years, you guys are spot on. You guys, uh, you guys are right in the sweet spot. Uh, I would still ask you to highlight that second bullet point. Every three to four years, no more than 25 acre grids. Moving forward on um, page 12 and 13, if you flip to page 12 and 13, some items I would highlight for you is again, uh, this, this whole field sampling is no longer really recommended, but this is a summary of the three kind of geospatial sampling um, systems, whole field versus zones versus grids. And the position that the tri-state really on, only takes is uh, whole field sampling is not where we need to be. We need to be at grids that are 25 acres or less. Similarly, on time of year, tri-states really emphasize soil sampling at the same time each year. Uh, that's contained in this paragraph with the second star. Um, if you're a spring soil sampler, stay spring soil sampling, or uh, if you're fall, stay fall. If you're gonna transition, just um, make that a conscious decision. We are switching our operation to spring sampling so we can better apply in the fall. And, and that's okay if you change, but make that change and, and stick with it. The other thing, questions that have been asked is, is how deep were the soil samples pulled? And so to kind of stay calibrated to the 1995 version of the Tri-States, all the research that went into building the 2020 revision, they were done on zero to eight inch or eight inch soil sample. Uh, I know those of you with uh, no-till or minimum till, you might be sampling a little shallower than that, and that's probably appropriate. Uh, however, in, in order to stay standardized, the sampling depth for this revision was uh, zero to eight. You can highlight that if you'd like. As I flip to the other page, or as we look at on, on page 13, Ed's gonna take over here, but uh, uh, my last emphasis point is get your soils uh, in the six to 6.8 uh, range for uh, best crop production. So, Ed, take over from here. Sarah, since I don't have little markers on that, whenever you need, just throw the polls in there, and I'll respond to that and uh, and uh, interact with the audience with that. So. So just put them in there where we got them put in there because I won't see that on my screen that I have here. Uh, where we're going to move into here next is uh, Eric gave a great overview in that executive summary on there. 
And of course, what we're going to do now is go specifically into different categories, try to explain a little more. Some of it may seem to be redundant to you, uh, but the whole idea there is, that to, is to try to emphasize uh, the changes. So if you're familiar with that 1995 one, which a lot of you apparently are because you do have it, uh, we would, you can see where you might need to pay attention to this 2020 one. Uh, kind of give a little background information also. Uh, why did we do this? Before 1995, each state had their own individual recommendations. And as we are in Fulton County, many of you are, anybody on that Michigan, uh, Ohio border or the Indiana, Ohio border, uh, you, you probably have a farm or land that goes into both states. And it would just seem to be uh, asinine that we changed recommendations because we changed state lines, but my soil didn't change, my farm didn't change. And so this was a cooperative effort uh, with a lot of different things back in 1995 to get Michigan State, Ohio State and Purdue to work together to uh, have recommendations that would as, as much as possible to be the same. So we wouldn't have this conflict of one state saying one thing and another one, even though we're farming both states right there on the line. So give you a little background information on that. Uh, so hey, some of the summary changes, Ed, we, yes. Hey, you need to share your screen. Okay. I was looking at my slide deck and it has your next slide in it, but uh, Sarah, Sarah suggested that she's not seeing your slides. We can sure try to correct that. And go to present. Yeah, Are they showing show. them now? Yes. Excellent. Some summary of changes for soil pH and lime. Because okay, the other was just verbiage anyway, so they weren't looking at it. They didn't see, need to see a lot on that slide anyway. Uh, just real quickly here for soil pH and lime. Uh, one of the changes, we do have a table in there that's new that brings in the effect of neutralizing power on how much lime material that you need. Uh, that's different than what was in the 1995. We didn't even talk about EMP in 1995. At that time, we would have been talking about TMP or total neutralizing power for ag lime that's 90, it's 90 plus TMP power. Don't even have to worry about that now for Ohio here in this new guide. Uh, Indiana and Michigan Lyme regulations do not use EMP. In fact, back in 1995, the three states have different Lyme regulations and they still do. So, uh, so it's just basic information when it comes to, to liming uh, in those as far as uh, neutralizing that, but actually how to do it, uh, each state's differently and you're gonna have to refer to those states information. In fact, you're gonna have to refer to pieces in addition to the tri-state rather than trying to, to make it so cumbersome by putting each state in there, we refer to other information pieces. Getting back to soil pH, uh, depending on part of the state that you're in, uh, you're, you're, you can have a soil pH as low as six and be effective for almost all crops except for alfalfa. And this is all based on where your, your subsoil is. Uh, if your subsoil is greater than a six, we can let that pH drop more because we're getting, uh, we're basically getting alkaline properties coming up from the B layer. And that's gonna help us up in our A layer of our soil surface. If you have a subsoil that's acidic, it's gonna do the other way. It's gonna be pulling down that, that topsoil. And of course there, you'd have to be more concerned about lime. Generally speaking, Eastern Ohio is the one that's got a subsoil pH less than six. Western Ohio is greater than six. Uh, if you don't like the term subsoil and that, basically look at your bedrock. If your, bed, if your subsoil is less than six, your bedrock is shale and sandstone. Uh, if, you're, if you're greater than six, it's six, it's because your bedrock is limestone and dolvastone. And of course here in the Northwest corner, it's limestone. And so we have a subsoil pH that's gonna be greater than six. And as a result, we don't have to add lime as much and we can let our pH drop more without it affecting our crop production out there. Just a quick map here to kind of visually show you uh, the counties where we have that subsoil that's greater than six. As you can see, definitely Western Ohio. And as we know, that's where all of our limestone quarries are. So it would make sense. Uh, you're not gonna find a quarry, a limestone quarry you get in Eastern Ohio. Uh, they have to ship it in from Western Ohio or Pennsylvania to get their limestone. So we look at the Ohio liming laws. They were revised in 1996. Uh, those laws were revised in. And that's what we brought in the term effective neutralizing power. And that's always given in pounds. 
Uh, and the reason why Ohio created this regulation is because we had a lot of wastewater treatment lime that was coming into the market and also pelletized lime. And the question then came in, how could farmers utilize that and compare it with our traditional ag lime? Uh, so EMP was created because it is the only value that you need on a lime analysis sheet uh, to be able to take care of anything that you work with on there. So we're going to go into more detail later on here over the next slide here. So as we look at EMP, uh, basically, it takes all the important quality components and puts it into one unit. And that's what we're calling the effective neutralizing power. It includes the purity of the lime. And we talk about purity, that's the percent TMP. And basically, the, the, the amount of, of calcium and magnesium you have in there, the more of that you have, the higher the TMP is going to be. It also takes into account the fineness of grind, because we do know the finer the particles, the faster it will neutralize soil. And because we got wastewater treatment lime, well, we got to look at moisture content because we found out some of the wastewater treatment lime a farmer was getting, uh, they were primarily getting by in water rather than lime. And so all three of these components are figured in there in the EMP. I bring this up because these are not in the tri-state bulletin, but that one table on how much lime you need will use the EMP. And here's that table that we wanna talk about here. Uh, this is table four on page 15. And as you can see, this is the tons of lime based on EMP uh, that you're gonna need. If you had a, a, a perfect lime source out there, it's gonna be 2000 pounds of EMP. We seldom see that. A lot of the quarry lime is gonna be around 1600, 1800. A lot of the wastewater treatment lime is gonna be a thousand. And so you gotta accommodate that to match up here of what you're gonna have in this chart. Always keep in mind, we're using the buffer pH off of that soil analysis to know how much lime we need to add. And the reason for that is your, your soil test of pH is based on a water test. Uh, the buffer pH takes into account uh, your various types of uh, <laughs> the water. The buffer pH takes in various types of uh, your CEC. So you're going to have to feed those sites of the CEC to be able to neutralize it with more calcium. And of course, we'll need more lime to do that. So just a quick summary here as we close out on soil pH and, and lime. Uh, crops do best between 6 and 6.8. Uh, in, the, in the northwestern part of Ohio, we can approach six more before we got to add lime. A higher soil pH is going to be more critical for soils with that subsoil less than six. That's primary eastern Ohio. And then the amount of lime needed for soil is going to be based on the buffer pH, not soil pH. And all the amount of lime that we apply should be based on EMP. Uh, one of the other things I want to mention here, uh, people have asked us, well, I get my lime source from Indiana or I get it from Michigan. And I'm not seeing EMP on that soil analysis. You need to ask that lime dealer for it. If they're selling lime in Ohio, it has to follow Ohio regulations, which means they have to have a lime analysis with EMP. They don't always show it or dig it out because they're primarily selling to the other states. But if they're legally selling lime in Ohio, they have to have that EMP and make sure it's in pounds and not in percent because Ohio regulation also requires it to be in pounds. So we're going to switch gears a little bit here and look at the fertilizer recommendations for phosphorus and potassium. Uh, the good news on, okay, here we got a poll and we'll, we'll do this poll right now. Thank you. Uh, basically asking us which extractant are you using currently uh, and to report your phosphorus levels. We're getting a slow response on this. It's good to be honest, right, Ed? Uh, that's good. right. <laughs> and it wouldn't bother me if they put the, I don't know, because uh, in, in many ways, the laboratory should be taking care of you. So you, they give you the best one. You don't have to worry about that. And we'll kind of talk about that here in a moment, too. And I'm glad to see that most people are saying it's the Malik 3. Uh, as you're going to find out in my discussion, if you were if you were using the Bray-1, uh, they're, they're using the Malik and converting it by calculation to Bray-1. So it's good to see that we're already kind of in our mind thinking about that change. You may have to remove that poll uh, each on your own. Yeah, I think they will. I've got to remove them mine, but as I, as I ran into and had to make the chat for someone this, what do I do? <laughs> So 
So just a quick summary as we get into details, as that poll already alluded to, malic, malic 3 is now the default soil extractant. And as we go with this, so we're not gonna give it any, any thought because it, they're all gonna be in that eventually we, we won't even be talking about Bray. Uh, we're also gonna look at about the fertilizer approach. It's basically the same, but we've made some adjustments to the buildup maintenance philosophy. We also know there are cases where a farmer may be uh, only using, may not know if he's gonna have that field in the future and wants to do a short-term type of uh, application. And then as Eric already alluded to an executive, we, we simplify the K recommendations, which I think is wonderful. That was really a pain in the past having all those different classes. And we'll talk more specifically about crop removal rates because it really changes our fertilizer recommendation rates, which we're gonna show here in examples. So the Malik 3 soil extract, and here's what we ran into. Uh, the old tri-state, all the research data that set up the curves and everything on how much phosphorus, how much potash you needed. If it was phosphorus, it was all based on the Bray-1, the Bray-P1 extractant and ammonium acetate for potassium. So what laboratories were doing out there is they were using an equation uh, converting their Malik numbers over to Bray. So we weren't actually using, uh, uh, comparing apples to apples per se. Now it wasn't all that bad uh, because uh, when you could look at the Malik system, it correlated very well with Bray. Uh, so there was some little error in there, but as a whole, it was, it was kind of even up, but we corrected that. So we don't have to worry about that anymore. But you may ask, well, why did we switch? Why, why Malik three? Well, the main reason is, is that's what the laboratories use. And that's because it's faster and it's less expensive. They can put one sample in, it's gonna give them the readings as it goes across the, uh, the, the, the system there. And they don't have to do different tests, which makes it cheaper and faster. And they don't have to convert it. So they were already doing Malik 3 for that reason. So I hate to use the term, but maybe the university is caught up uh, knowing that that's what the real world is doing. And so what we did, we collected all these samples all these soil samples from all these sites across Ohio. And then of course, Purdue was doing it also, and Michigan State was also doing it. Basically, so we could get everything collected and evaluated in the Malik 3 system. So you can feel confident with this new tri state system, we're not doing any calculations or switching around. Well, we feel comfortable the numbers we have in the current or the 2020 tri state is reflects what a Malik curve would reflect. And so basically we're just gonna discontinue talking about Bray uh, from, a, from a commercial side, maybe academic side will, will still be doing it in the same way with the ammonium acetate with the potash. So, uh, but that's why it took a while uh, when Steve Coleman got here to basically get the new tri-state out because we had to gather the data because it hadn't been done in the past. It's, it's an interesting thing. Uh, all the grant money and all that will not cover all this soil sample. Unfortunately, the commodity groups in Ohio uh, funded this so we could get this information. And that's partially why you didn't have it before is because funding, lack of funding to do the testing and all these field tests out there. So it's, it, was a, it was a major uh, effort and I, my hat's off to Steve Coleman and others for getting this all done. Here's your 1995, what we call the buildup maintenance curve. As you can see, there was three areas. Eric talked about it earlier, using the term deficient, optimal, and, and, uh, and sufficient. There was a change in philosophy here. At the time, uh, the, the, the soil fertility specialists with this one were concerned that there was enough error out there and we collecting soil samples and laboratory net that we put a little hedge in there. And so we had this drawdown area that even though we were above what we call the optimal, we'll gradually bring it back in case we'd made mistakes. We feel confident enough now that we don't need to do that and we can work toward the upper end of the optimal and don't have to put in extra just in case uh, like we did in past. And this is particularly important as we're moving more into thinking about water quality and trying to make sure we get less nutrients that might go into our watershed. So the 2021 still following this system here, except we've knocked down this drawdown range where we basically said, economically and also for agronomically, we don't need to go past the upper end of the optimum range there. And we're still using that term maintenance on there. So uh, it's gonna be confusing. Uh, we, even, we even did it in a tri-state. We showed the little chart earlier and called it optimal. Here we're back calling it maintenance. And I'm old school, been around long enough. You're gonna hear me talk about it. It's the build up maintenance system on there. 
critical things, as Eric already mentioned, the critical level, uh, that's the, the level of nutrients we need to have in that soil test where we should have a very low probability of having yield loss. And in the maintenance range, we are saying that going above this, there is no advantage. You're not gonna get any improvement on your crop yields. So we're gonna work between those two areas, but if we're below that critical level, this system would say, you're gonna to have to build it up, put more fertilizer on, because we want things to be every year in that maintenance range. And that gives us a lot of flexibility as a producer out there. And I'll explain that why here in a, in a slide coming up here. Uh, for one, it gives you a target range. As Eric said earlier, a farmer with these recommendations now know where they need to be to, to minimize their cost but maximize their yields. The thing of this system is designed to replace the nutrients that are going to be taken off uh, from the crop that year and replacing them ahead of time so you're always in that optimal range. So we don't expect a response for fertilizer the year we put that application on. And the other beauty of this, you know, we always get concerned, do I need to put, a, do I need a band, broadcast, all these different things. When you're in this optimal range, the placement method really doesn't matter because we've already got something to cover our bases out there. I know Eric showed this earlier, but I want to go over it again. We got here in the in a red, red numbers, that's your critical level. Uh, I would encourage you all, th these are numbers, if you have a lot of acres, a lot of soil tests, that you get very familiar from your mind. I know as an agronomist, uh, I have these numbers in my mind. When a farmer brings into a soil test, I'm immediately looking for these ranges to see where that soil test is on phosphorus and potassium. Uh, really, they have not, the phosphorus curves or rates have not changed really at all from 1995, except we now got them in the Malik uh, system. Uh, we do have changes in the potassium one, it's actually dropped. And of course, as we said, we got sandy soils and loam and clay soils uh, to make it a lot easier. Keep in mind, wheat and alfalfa definitely need more phosphorus. Uh, than corn and soybeans. So if you got wheat in the rotation, you need to think about that higher critical level if you wanna make sure you have optimum yields in your wheat and don't have uh, deficiencies. So I put this in there, this is a number I always look at. And as we get more into water quality, uh, these are important numbers. Now this is really what I call an economic number. Some people throw it agronomic uh, either way, but the point of it is, if my soil test doesn't need to be over 40 parts per million to raise good corn and soybeans. And so if I'm buying fertilizer and I'm already at 40, I'm basically making an investment I don't need. And those dollars probably should be used somewhere else. And the same way for wheat, uh, the wheat's gonna be higher. It's gonna be 50 parts per million. So I guess I would say, if you're gonna have a rotation with wheat in it, you probably wanna be looking at having that, uh, that higher critical level uh, with wheat and possibly go up to 50. But if you're corn and soybeans, uh, you can reduce that amount of phosphorus you're gonna need uh, by, by keeping it uh, at a lower rate. <laughs> Potassium, it doesn't matter, as you can see, as much. We, we do have a higher end rate on there, but the water quality issue didn't come in there. So it's more of an economic decision in there. But we do have that upper end. And of course, in the past, uh, after this, we would have said drawdown. And we're not saying it now. We're now saying above these numbers, you don't need these nutrients. And the beauty of it is, if you've been soil testing and, and following this buildup maintenance system, you, you aren't, you're going to have, if you have these numbers above, these numbers, you're not going to need any of that fertilizer for three to four years. And so you can make your budget pretty easy. If you got a soil test back and it says 45 and phosphorus and you're growing corn and soybeans, you're not going to need any phosphorus applied to that field for three to four years. And of course, you'll soil test later and you'll see if you can, you'll need it then. So this is really a, a sound practice as far as the environment, but also for your pocketbook out there too. Just want to show you the calculations because basically when we say maintenance range, all we're doing is we're taking what we expect our yield to be and then we're going to use those, uh, those nutrient removal rates and multiply that by that yield. So it's yield by nutrient removal. So we're just trying to say this is what my crop has taken off and I'm going to put it back in. If you're below that critical level and we're in a buildup range, as you can see on the second half of that equation, there's the buildup component and that CL is going to be is going to be critical level and STP is going to be soil test phosphorus uh, on there. And you can see that we've got an increase multiplied by five because we're trying to gradually build that phosphorus level up to get us in that maintenance optimal range. And so a lot of places we use these equations rather than a table to make a prediction of what your 
what your recommendation should be. Here's the same one for potassium. And the reason why I bring this one up, because it's the same thing. We got this extra on here for buildup. You see this plus 20. Uh, Michigan is not using this. So this is only Indiana and Ohio that's using this. Uh, we affectionately, or I affectionately call it the J. Johnson fudge factor. And the reason for that is we know we have a lot of clay in our soil and clay can fix uh, potassium. And so in some ways there's concern that if we don't feed the, the soil a little bit, it's gonna hold on to it and not release it for the crop. And so this 20 is our hedge factor there to try in case that happens, uh, we don't become short with potassium because we gave it a little extra to compensate for that in case our clay soils do that or our, our high clay content soils do that to us. Want to quickly look at this uh, grain nutrient removal. As you can see here, obviously our all of our hybrids and varieties are more efficient now. They don't uh, they don't need as much nutrients to give us our yield, and so we got a decrease pretty well across the board in everything. Soybean was one of them that was pretty well, uh, at least on phosphorus was the same. But you can see everything took a significant drop on how much potash uh, that that grain is taken into it at harvest time. And so that is gonna save us fertilizer in the end because that's crop removal and we're not removing as many nutrients as we take that grain off of the field. And I think it's pretty interesting to see that change and see that percent decrease as we're going into more modern hybrids. So, so maybe we don't change our, we didn't change per se our rate, but in a lot of ways we have because we've changed the crop removal and the crop removal has taken less off than it would have been 20 years ago. Just want to just quickly show you, particularly for phosphorus, how it takes a while to lower our soil test, as we're showing here in that first line in corn, using that the crop removal rate of 0.35, the yield 175. We know we take around 61 pounds of phosphorus off. We're only going to drop our soil test only by three parts per million. And that's figuring 20 pounds uh, of fertilizer, additional fertilizer to equal that one part per million. So it's, it's not a lot uh, that we take off each year. And so, all the university recommendations have taken this all into account, what they recommend to you with the crop removal and other things, but it helps to visualize sometimes for people to see that, you know, if you're really high in your phosphorus levels, it may, it'll take a while to bring it down. Uh, we want to mention that the, what the, a lot of places call the sufficiency recommend, recommendation. Uh, and what we do here, uh, basically a farmer uh, doesn't want to make a big investment. They want to make a short term uh, uh, type of recommendation. And so they just use the maintenance, whether it's in the buildup range or not. And that's why I drew the line through there on maintenance because uh, maintenance implies critical level to maintenance limit. Uh, this is crop removal. And that's why I drew a line through that. To me, the maintenance was confusing there. We're basically using crop removal, whether I'm in a maintenance or buildup area. And the whole idea that uh, a person may want to do that is we only want to apply P and K for what we think the crop needs that year. Uh, we usually, most people don't want to put more than crop removal on at that time. And they don't want to invest for future years. Uh, and, and I can understand this. You know, if I own my ground, I'd really encourage you to do the build up maintenance system. But if you're renting ground, uh, because if you're not sure you're going to have that ground in the future, why would you want to buy potash and, and phosphorus for a future farmer who's going to be running that ground? So you want to make sure you do it when you have that ground. And so if it's uncertain where you're going to have it year to year, you may want to follow this approach. Also, if we get a year, uh, fertilizer prices are really kind of doing weird stuff and grain prices are low. Uh, we're a little uncertain there how much we want to invest on the short term. We got cash flow or loan concerns. We may want to look at this approach only one year rather than the, than the building up or, or, or maintaining it. Of course, this whole ideal is maintaining it uh, if you're in that maintenance zone. There is some risk and uh, they go quite a bit of it here in a tri-state guide talking about it. We know that if your phosphorus soil levels are low or your potash, where you're significantly below that critical level, uh, the soil really wants to hang on to those. And so if you're only putting crop removal, if you're below that critical level, you may actually suffer some yield loss with that. So I, I basically say just do what we normally would do, but just put a one year on rather than multiple years. If, if you're below that critical level, you probably want to put a little build up on there. Uh, but uh, it, because if we only go a crop removal, you may help hurt yourself in the short run. 
I always look at the soil test data. I think a lot of farmers wanted to do this because I won't even take the soil test. I'm just going to put crop removal and don't worry about it uh, because you might find out that you're in that upper range. You don't need to put anything on anyway. So even if it's a short term uh, land lease, uh, I would still recommend base that off of a recent soil test. Just quickly here, this should be review. You would have had it in uh, your training to get your fertilizer a certificate. How we do a recommendation, we're going to look at phosphorus here. Uh, this one's coming from page 36, so we have the buildup numbers. You always know where the maintenance numbers are because that's where the hyphenated area is. And they're going to be the same because you're in that sweet spot, that, that optimal range. And so we treat it the same no matter whether you're 20 or 40. It's when you go above that, we'd say nothing, and you go below it, you're going to need a little more. So if you had a 200 bushel corn crop uh, and you were in that maintenance range, uh, we would just, where those two columns, where the line and the columns intersect, that's what we're going to put on there. So it'd be 70 pounds of phosphorus in this example. Uh, you would follow something similar if potash would do it the same way. And just to remind people, how do we do that application for multiple years? Say you had a, a corn, soybean, wheat rotation, a lot of times people would do the soil test after the weed harvest. That'll determine their requirement for the corn uh, for that year. Then you would use that exact same soil test and look at it for soybean. That would be the amount that you would be needing to add for the second year in the rotation. And then you do the same thing for the wheat for the third year, you'd add the three together. And if I was gonna put on my phosphorus needs for those three crops for three years, uh, that's what I would put on. You know, hopefully you would incorporate it. If it was a large amount, I would definitely say incorporate it or not do the three years to minimize potential for water quality concerns. And then, of course, we would soil test again after the next wheat harvest. So wherever you are in that rotation, if it was corn, soybean, the same thing, you can do it every two years. So just a reminder that if we do this right, uh, we only have to soil sample every three, four years, and we only have to put fertilizer on every three to four years. Just to show the potassium fertilizer recommendation, I'm not going to match that up on there, but just to remind you uh, that we now only have two classes over here uh, with a sandy soil, less than five. And, and the reason why this is low, or, or how much potash you can put on, uh, sand has very little C, the low CEC means they have very low ability to hold nutrients. And so you could imbalance it by putting on too much potash, which might make other nutrients deficient. And then also if you overload the system, you can actually have the potash leach from the soil. And as a result, we, we don't wanna lose that potash, we're paying for it. So we reduce the recommendation. Down here, we got good CEC that can hold things very well. And so we can put more on. Just, just quickly here, you can find the, the complete fertilizer tables uh, in the latter part of the section on phosphorus and potassium. But as Eric used earlier, there is a table on page 29, I don't say pages, but page 29, that only gives the maintenance range and has all the crops together. So you've got so a couple of choices here, which table you wanna use. So in summary here, we would still recommend a build up maintenance philosophy, but we do know there's cases where that sufficiency option you may want to use, uh, particularly in short term leases. Uh, all the recommendations are now based on Malik 3. Uh, so we really, that's going to become a moot point. We're not going to talk about Bray ammonium acetate anymore. It's just automatically in Malik 3. Uh, potassium recommendations went from four classes to two CE classes. And our grain nutrient removal levels have been moved, have been changed to reflect our better efficiency in our in our hybrids and our varieties out there. And I know we're going to make a change here, and Eric's going to come back with you after we do. Hey, uh, very good, Ed. Thank you for that uh, thorough uh, th thorough look at at P and K and uh, liming to start off with. So kind of a, a knowledge check here. Uh, I'm pulling up my slides, so I'm just gonna stay silent and let you read the answers. Read the question and answer question. Um, Ed or Sarah, can you confirm that you see uh, my PK uh, summary in poll, poll seven? Yes, I do. Awesome. All right. A uh, couple more answer on this uh, optimal range. Uh, choose one uh, P range and one K range for a loamy clay soil. 
in uh, a corn soybean rotation. And uh, not quite everybody uh, skated on this round, but uh, we have seven, we, we have uh, almost 70%. So uh, share the results. Uh, the correct answer is the are the ones that you chose. So um, in this situation, the optimal range is, for P is 20 to 40 parts per million malic and K is 120 to 170 parts per million. So um, very good. Let's keep rolling. Uh, so I'm going to go back to the book, if you would. Uh, I'll show my... I should be have my video up just a second. There we go. Um, if you go back to page 16 and 17, actually I want to zero in on page 17 just for a nitrogen review. Uh, the, the, the heavy lift on the tri-state fertility guide was with regard to uh, P and K. And Ed did a really nice job of, of going into depth and into detail there. But there's obviously a section towards the middle front middle of the book on nitrogen. And so uh, key concepts that I'd ask you to highlight again or put a star next to these sec the second and third bullet point. Again, the nitrogen rate recommendations are now being based on an economic model designed to maximize farmer profitability, otherwise known as the maximum return to nitrogen or MRTN model available at that website. Sarah's gonna throw that up in the chat and I am going to uh, use it the third bullet point there that I'll, I want you to highlight is again the wheat and we'll uh, subtle changes for wheat that we'll identify. So I'm going a little bit off screen or, or out of the booklet and I'm going to screenshots of the website, the corn nitrogen rate calculator on uh, Iowa's website. I'll give it a little background before uh, Sarah throws up the poll. Um, this is a rate calculator site for the states highlighted in green. You can evaluate single price versus multiple price and uh, get a calculation of end rates. Sarah, let's have that poll. Super simple question. I have used the corn nitrogen rate calculator in the past. Yes, I have, it's slick. No, I have not, but I am clicking on the link in chat right now. Uh, so I'm, I'm asking you to multitask and go to that chat link that Sarah has thrown in there um, and we'll end the poll. Most of you have used it. So uh, nearly 80% of you have used the core nitrogen rate calculator or at least seen it. Uh, so I'm, I'm uh, happy with that. That's great. So uh, two more screenshots associated with this core nitrogen rate calculator. Um, here's the entry screen. Uh, you can choose your state that's in kind of those corn belt states your rotation, uh, whether it's corn following soybeans, corn on corn, there might be even corn after alfalfa, um, but uh, key rotations, uh, select your source of nitrogen and then what you uh, are anticipating paying for it. And it calculates a cost per unit of N as well as uh, the formula needs what your anticipated corn price is. It could be maybe what you've hedged it at. It could be what you believe you're gonna get this fall. Um, could be the crop insurance price, whatever whatever number you want to use. Uh, for our example, we're using $650 per ton nitrogen or anhydrous and $4 corn. Now, uh, in if you bought anhydrous, this is not necessarily this year. Of course, it could be working its way towards 650, but um, most of you, if you priced your nitrogen anhydrous, it was uh, could have been even been sub five hundred dollars uh, before the new year. Uh, in January, it, it uh, worked its way up into five hundred dollars uh, per ton. So uh, once you click submit, it kicks out this rate and it, it, this kind of interface where it gives you uh, the ideal nitrogen rate, the maximum return to nitrogen of one hundred and eighty pounds of N total. Uh, with a profitability range, you know, it's, it's kind of putting a finger on one number, 180 units, but suggesting that there's a profitability range and weather variability that's associated with nitrogen. And so 164 to 106, 196 total units of N will maximize your profit with regard to nitrogen 98% of the time. 
Uh, it's also important to note in Ohio, and it, it, there were 228 sites, I believe 16 or 17 of those sites uh, were right here in Northwest Ohio and Fulton County. Um, some of them were corn on corn. So a, a good subset of data came from this Northwest Ohio region. Uh, as you look at the chart down here from economics class or from life, uh, I think this red line really makes sense to a lot of us. Um, it, it is the essentially the line of the law of diminishing return. At some point in time, the costs of nitrogen are going to exceed the, uh, the revenue generated. Okay, the blue line suggests that as we apply more nitrogen, uh, to a certain point that gross return, their, therefore yield, is going to continue to etch up uh, fractionally. Um, at some point in time, it turns into the law of diminishing return. This red dot is the spot where it turns, and we suggest it's 100, or the chart suggests it's a rate of 180 total units. So pretty slick little calculator, in my opinion. Uh, I hope some of you get a chance uh, to use it more during the season. So we'll go back to the book, page 18 and 19 in the book. Please turn there with me. 18 and 19, I, I don't even have any, any animation on here, um, but really talks about nitrogen placement, trying to get nitrogen below the surface, uh, unless you're applying to a growing crop. Uh, talks a little bit about nitrogen sources, but things that we've kind of learned in our agronomy classes uh, and the school of life uh, over, over the years. Generally, we find that farmers choose their nitrogen source based on safety, availability, and price. So um, moving forward, the next page, page 20 and 21, as we flip through the book, uh, the left-hand page really identifies that uh, as a three-state region, we don't necessarily agree on how corn nitrogen rates are calculated. So uh, Michigan, Indiana, and Ohio all kind of use a little bit different system. That's why we're going to move to page 22. On page 22, table 8 and 9 are the Ohio end rate charts. So just like the corn nitrogen rate calculator on the Iowa State webpage uh, utilized a price per bushel of corn as well as a price per unit of nitrogen fertilizer. This chart kind of simplifies it in 25 cent increments in corn and five cent increments per unit of nitrogen across the top. Uh, just a, a pretty basic and simple chart that if you uh, aren't able to use the cal online calculator, you have this chart on on page 22, table eight is uh, corn after soybeans. Table nine is corn after corn. Um, if we review what we did on the, the corn nitrogen rate calculator, the website, we simply took $4 corn and 40 cent nitrogen uh, and the economics of that, the maximum return to nitrogen rate kicks out at 180 total units of N. Hopefully that's pretty straightforward. It's pretty much this, the cap on corn. Uh, the bottom of page 22 and into 23 reviews the nitrogen rates for soft red winter wheat. Um, and and uh, this is a starting point uh, as it indicates in the bottom left-hand corner of 22, but you might find that uh, it needs to morph a little bit for your operation. But in general, the table that we're recommending you, you highlight is table 10, which is a total nitrogen package. So your fall starter plus your spring applied, uh, it's generally about a 1.2 units of nitrogen per anticipated bushel of yield goal. Um, and that's very similar to what the 1995 recommendation was. So uh, for those of you shooting for 100 bushel uh, wheat, uh, the recommendation by the tri-states is 120 total units of N. So that would, you know, maybe that's 20 units in the fall and another 32 to 35 gallons of 28% of top dressed in the spring. So uh, you netting up to about 100 more units in the spring. Um, Ed is a wheat fertility expert and Ed will, will sit here and say, there is nothing to gain 
by applying more than 120 total units of N. Am I correct, Ed? 120, nothing, there, there's, that is the, the break point, law of, no re, or of diminishing returns. We've been doing nitrogen rate trials and, and probably out of the 20 years I've done it maybe once, that if I put 120 in the spring and 20 in the fall, I get a slightly increase. So, so th this, this really matches up what we've seen in Ohio very well. Yep. Very good. Um, that's a perfect, that's, that's good timing. We're going to switch over to, uh, Ed at this point. Um, and while maybe we'll throw up that, let me stop share Ed and we'll go from there. While Ed's pulling a slide up, let's throw up that other poll. Uh, it's the sulfur poll, Ed, is that okay? Sure. There we go. On average, I apply blank pounds of sulfur per corn acre. And Ed, your slides are in gallery view. I know yet. that. I was just okay. given a chance to do the poll. <laughs> All right. There we go. Heavy use of sulfur Ed, by this group. Well, I think it's, you know, it's it, peer pressure is pretty great when it comes to sulfur right now and the trade magazines and all. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that here as we look at the, the secondary nutrients and micronutrients here, kind of get more in, in the details here as we come in the very end. Uh, but I'm gonna go and go, go clear this on my one screen here and move on to the next one here. Uh, just There's not a whole lot here as far as new. Uh, in reality, between the 1995 and, and 2000, 2020, we've, we've actually done research out there, so it's not like we're in the dark. Uh, we've done a lot of research, and, and well, they really called things very well in 1995. Probably the one that's got people the most uh, anxious would be sulfur, and we'll kind of cover where the university is coming from, what we're seeing in Ohio there. Uh, but we also got malic three. People don't think about that we need to have a minimum, a critical level of calcium and magnesium. That's also being based on malic three now. There's a crop removal table for sulfur. I don't really know how to use it, but we got it in there. Uh, it would match up probably for those that, that, that think we were, were probably taking off about uh, 10 to 20 pounds of sulfur in a grain. Usually about 10 is what's going off in the grain. And then, uh, uh, Coleman has three years of a nice tissue analysis data just for Ohio on the micronutrients at different growth stages for corn and soybean, which he basically showed no relationship to anything, but, uh, but we do actually have some numbers for people might want to compare against with that. Uh, here's that critical level. Uh, we generally don't talk about this. And once again, we got the sands and the loams and the clays, just like we did with potash, because these are cations, uh, at least the calcium, magnesium. Sulfur really doesn't fit this sand in that thing in there. And, and I think they just stuck it in there to have it somewhere uh, in the table. But these are cations, which means uh, the higher the CEC, the more we can hold these, the lower the sands, uh, the less we can hold those. Uh, generally speaking, we always have way more calcium in this area because we got limestone as our bedrock on there. Where I see shortages in the past, and particularly in other parts of Ohio, is going to be magnesium. I've never seen a calcium shortage unless somebody really deliberately did something bad on what they were applying to their field. But we have had many cases where we have magnesium deficiencies, uh, particularly in the east and the south. And we used to have it around the Toledo area. Uh, but those soils that were prone to that, we put basically have paved them all over uh, for Metro Toledo. This is what the 1995 statement would be, and this would still be the university, or at least Ohio's response. Where would we recommend you put sulfur? Got sandy soils, low CEC, can't store there. It's going to bleach out. Soils lower in organic matter. Uh, once again, the organic matter, it mineralizes and provides the sulfur for the crop. So if you don't have a lot of organic matter, you don't have a lot that can be mineralized that come to the crop. Cold, too wet, too dry conditions because the mineralization is slow. Roots aren't doing a whole lot. I, you know, I, I put this in there because a lot of uh, academia will talk about it. it. To me, this is, you know, that can happen all the time here in Ohio. Uh, and basically adding more sulfur won't change it. Uh, we got to have the, the weather conditions change and then things fix themselves out. And then just common sense. Hey, I've been measuring this and I see a yield response because I've been doing the strip chiles. So I know I got a historic response. So these are the places where we see we need sulfur. If you notice, most of our soils are medium to fine textured. You don't see that on there as something that responds to sulfur. 
And this is what we've done. This is all recent data. This is an old data, like the wheat data. I just completed a four-year study in wheat. I never got a response anywhere in the state uh, for to sulfur on there. <laughs> Uh, Laura Lindsay put everything all along the soybean performance trials. So you got 30 of them there. She got two responses. And we've done the same thing with corn. And if, if Coleman did a lot of that work, we got five sites out of 52 of a yield increase. And we got actually a yield decrease out of three of them. And we haven't seen anything in the forage we have. So we have not seen a big demand, at least from the university research, for sulfur out there in Ohio on the places where we have tested this. Uh, now that could change down the road and I know the trade magazines it's all the buzz uh, particularly uh, Purdue threw out that thing 20 I mean a huge increase with soybeans I was going to throw a number out there but since it's being recorded I don't want to be held to it to uh, Eric on that <laughs> but but a significant increase it's got everybody talking about that and uh, and as I talked to Eric uh, before we have not seen that in print yet the published data and all that to, to vet to whether what type of soil was on and if there are special reasons why they've got that but the press really ran with that but uh, I wanted to share some data that Jim Camarado from Purdue shared with us uh, that what you think about, uh, well, is it really doing wonderful things in Indiana? And Ohio just hasn't got the right measurement out there yet. Uh, this is, you can see from depending on the year 2017 to 2020, all these different sites, it points out 11 out of the 28 trials, they got an increased yield that's less than 50%. Uh, and so, and I do want to point out, since I've lived in Indiana and used to work for Country Mark, and Indiana is part of my territory, I know this area down here, you're seeing some response on here. Now, this isn't the melon country down around Vincennes, Knox County, it's sandier soil. This is a port up here. It tends to be sandier soil, which would hit that thing, we'd say you'd probably get a sulfur response. Uh, here, of course, at the agronomy farm, I didn't get any. I'm not quite sure going down or why in 2018 things were really good and why over here in 2017 were real good. But you can see up here in the northeast corner at their site closest to us, and even three out of the four years uh, just south of that, they didn't get a response to sulfur. Uh, so Purdue's only one has kind of popped out some results here. Illinois' data hasn't shown results, and Michigan State hasn't shown results, and Ohio hasn't stayed, shown results. So, uh, so I guess my report is the university data wouldn't say we just need to add sulfur out there. But as I talked to Eric before, you know, we always want to say, if I was going to do that one thing, that one micro or sulfur or, or one of these specialty uh, things we add on there, if I was going to try one, well, sulfur would be the one I'd put the best bet on if you might get a response. But I wouldn't be surprised if you told me you didn't get a response uh, with it. Partially, we're still getting sulfur from atmospheric nitrogen. I mean, atmospheric sulfur. We're still getting it here in Northwest Ohio, much, much less, but we're still getting, and the crop doesn't need a lot. To, you know, we got cover crops putting in heavily residue. We get things out of the residue. If you're putting manure on, you just don't need sulfur. You're gonna be getting your micros and, and, and sulfur out of manure. So it just makes it an easy decision. And we're still getting it from some of our herbicides. This is Purdue work with the Indiana chemist. And you can see there, if you put on MAP, they're showing 75 pounds of phosphorus, uh, either from MAP or DAP, we're getting anywhere from a two to five pounds of sulfur that's included with that. So if you're putting on uh, a, a phosphorus product in the fall, uh, you really probably don't, that's another thing, you've already put on sulfur anyway, that, the, that you probably don't need to put on additional sulfur because you're going to get it from that phosphorus fertilizer out there too. So if you're trying to decide what year do I, do I throw it in or what year I don't, I mean it's relatively inexpensive as Eric showed, $6 an acre uh, for th ammonium thiosulfate, so it's, uh, so uh, it just depends on how much insurance you want to put in there, uh, whether you think you really need it. But for me from Ohio State, for me to make a recommendation, I have to see something that's going to benefit you more than 50% of the time, ideally 70% of the time. And as you saw Purdue, even the best in the corn, it was only 34 in the low 30s on there. And in Ohio, it's even less than that. So from a probability side, we don't see a high probability of putting it on most of our soils. But I'm not going to fault find you for doing that. I mean, I probably would be doing the same thing too, particularly of all my neighbors and everything I keep reading because it's only six bucks an acre. Want to stress this though. 
The soil test is not useful at all. So just because the retailer shows you a sulfur test from your soil test, ignore it. It's, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't relate well to your field conditions, just like we don't have a nitrogen test on it. It can leach below it. It doesn't really tell us what you're going to have. Uh, Purdue did work with whole plant analysis at Cydress, didn't help. Uh, they also did leaf analysis. We have done leaf analysis at Silking. It, you really can't make a recommendation on how much sulfur you need off of tissue analysis. The best way or, or the real way you can tell whether your soils are going to respond to sulfur is what I call the fact check. Put a strip trial out there. If you put sulfur on the field, make sure you have strips that you don't put any sulfur on there to see what your yield advantage or not advantage. Or, or if you're trying to decide to do it, put strips out there where you do have sulfur and then the rest of the field doesn't have it. This is the only way you're going to prove whether you really need sulfur is to put these strip trials out there with and without sulfur on your given field. Then you're building that history. Real quickly here on micronutrients, because we're running out of time, basically things have not changed. Uh, there are special situations where we have seen you need micronutrients in foliar applications. As a whole, though, we don't see a benefit from them. Uh, generally, it's when your pH is out of whack, you're over seven, you're below six. Do we maybe see some benefit with some of the foliars? A lot of work's been done on this in, in, the, in the states east of the Mississippi. Iowa did an extensive test and did not find the benefits from adding the micro. So we, the table is the same one as 1995. These are the situations where we've seen maybe you might see a benefit from micros. And that they're really rare. I'm just going to put it, it's rare that we get a benefit when we put micros out there. So in summary, uh, most soils we know have adequate calcium and magnesium and our research would say sulfur at this time that may change down the road uh, as we do get less atmospheric sulfur but right now the data is not picking that up uh, here's the critical thing <laughs> since we don't have soils responding to sulfur it's difficult to tell you how much you put on because you don't get a response uh, in Iowa, where they're getting a response, and even Purdue said the low number at seven and a half pounds was enough to give them a response. So I was pleased to see, you know, probably no, it depends where you want to put it on there, the, the ease of the, the calculations. I would never put any more than 20 pounds at all at this time if you're in a non responsive soil, and, and, and probably most of the time, 10 is going to be fine uh, on there as far as where would you go. Like I said, micronutrient deficiencies are rare unless you've got a, an unusual soil pH going on. And even for the micros and sulfur, your yield strip trials of having places with and without is your best way to see if that particular field is going to respond uh, to those nutrients. I know it's quick there, Eric, but I know people want to call it a night and get a number from you. And there was one question um, okay. in the chat box, and it just says, with the sulfur, how was it placed, dual band or broadcast? Well, from, uh, uh, from the work that we have usually done, it's uh, with corn, uh, we're usually injecting it with our 28, you know, either at planting or, uh, uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's basically in a band where I could like put our 28. From the work I've seen other states, it doesn't matter on there. And particularly since our soils aren't really responsive, uh, I don't think it's gonna matter. Now, if we did have a deficient soil, anytime we ban something, it's gonna be better. Uh, but I, I guess at this stage, I would not be too worried about it, uh, whether I'm broadcasting ammonium sulfate or injecting ammonium thiosulfate uh, or broadcasting even gypsum because it's a good sulfur source. Uh, the only problem is if we use elemental sulfur, we want to make sure we probably put that on several months ahead of time so we can get it in the sulfate ion when that time. So that would be my experience at this time. Our research, most of it has been injected with 28%. At least my wheat work has been done. And years ago, I, I did it as a dry a starter with ammonium sulfate. And so I don't think it matters. Very good, good question. Uh, well, we'll move forward, Ed, again, thanks for the uh, comments on secondary nutrients and micronutrients. Uh, as we wrap up the, uh, the, the Tri-State Fertility Virtual Walk, I just wanna really say thanks to the Ohio Soybean Council and your corn and small grains checkoff dollars, uh, along with these other partners that worked with us on uh, uh, on pulling the tri-state fertilizer recommendations together. So a good project that uh, came from your um, checkoff dollars. So uh, I do want to make a, put in a shameless plug here for uh, the the e-fields report. And some of you that signed up early and 
we're able to get our, our uh, mailing out. You got a copy of the eFields report, the one that's all the way on the right hand side. Uh, this effort was started, a uh, concerted effort in 2017 uh, to, to kind of pull together some uh, relevant on-farm research that's been happening across the state. Uh, most notably field length trials, but not always. Um, and it's grown to be, uh, to involve, uh, include 218 trials this year across 36, 39 counties uh, with a lot of partner farms and industry partners. If you're interested in participating in e-fields, uh, you really just have to have a, a farmer related question that you'd like to, uh, you know, to, to have the question answered and we can help you set up a replicated randomized field trial, adequately collect the, the data that will make the project relevant to you and to other folks' uh, operations. And it may end up in the eFields report, not all projects end up in there, but certainly uh, a chunk of them. So uh, again, these are the folks that are involved, Extension State Specialists, Educators, Partner Farmers, and uh, we just have some wonderful industry partners that help make it it possible. Uh, we're not going to look at these tonight, but these are some of my some some local and also very interesting e fields projects that I encourage you to dog ear. Um, I really like the soybean seeding rate information. There's a pretty good data subset there that, that creates a case for lower seeding rates. A starter phosphorus trial, a cover crops ahead of corn trial. Uh, as a as a Western Ohio group, we have done a tremendous amount of manure side dress research that's captured on page, or starting at page 42. Uh, some of you on this call know that I've done a, a fair amount of work on uh, winter barley uh, with a peer learning group or a cohort. That data is captured on page 200. And then we've recently added some, uh, some, some simple or baseline soil health data. Um, across multiple counties and farms starting on page 222. So those are things that I encourage you to, to uh, dog ear if you would. What are your questions? Um, not sure if there's anything in chat. Let me go to chat, Q and A. Um, yeah, Sarah put up the eFields link. I encourage you all to, to take a look at it if, if you didn't, weren't able to get the actual booklet. Um, and then uh, Sarah does uh, a message I asked her to put in there for Ed and myself. Uh, you will be getting a, a kind of a teaching evaluation form. Uh, it's just a web link that uh, we'd ask Ed and I would ask you to evaluate our, our teaching tonight in this program. Um, it takes you about two minutes to answer some uh, one to five like your questions. Um, so Sarah, did you stop this? Uh, stop the video too? I think maybe you 